stake. Respond online today. Shape your future. Start here at 2020census.gov. I can tell you that uh, we've spent the last three days, actually the last four days, trying to get to some kind of consensus, at least to start uh, negotiating. Uh, yesterday was uh, a step in the right direction. Uh, our staffs are actually working today. We'll be meeting again tomorrow. But I'm not optimistic that there will be a solution in the very near term. Welcome back to Morning Joe. It's Monday, August the 3rd. Still with us, we have Mike Barnacle, Jonathan Lemire, Casey Hunt, and Jason Johnson. And joining the conversation, former U.S. Senator, now on NBC News and MSNBC political analyst, Claire McCaskill. Erin Haynes is with us. She is editor-at-large for the nonprofit newsroom, The 19th, which officially launched yesterday. We also have political reporter for The Washington Post and MSNBC political analyst Robert Costa. He's a moderator of Washington Week on PBS. Uh, Claire McCaskill, um, while the Boston Red Sox have been struggling with some of the worst pitching uh, I've ever seen in the major leagues, uh, we, you got guys pitching 81-mile-an-hour fastballs high, down the middle of the plate. <laughs> By the way, if they want somebody that can pitch faster, they should just call the pitching staff at Pensacola Catholic High School. I think we've got some guys there that can pitch 83 or 84 miles an hour. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, but that said, uh, obviously our thoughts were the St. Louis Cardinals and also the Miami Marlins especially. Uh, man, bad outbreaks. Those two teams uh, share spring training facilities, but both right now suffering uh, with an outbreak of coronavirus. What can you tell us? Well, I think, um, first of all, it, in some ways, it is helpful to the rest of Missouri. I mean, Missouri, we love our Cardinals, and we have a terrible outbreak going on in Missouri. We've got a governor that refuses to wear a mask. Uh, we've got a governor that refuses to mandate a mask. He is totally walking in Trump's shadow, doesn't do anything that Trump doesn't tell him to do. So the fact that this has hit the Cardinals, who've used every protocol possible and still are seeing this kind of outbreak, uh, hopefully is a wake-up call to more Missourians that the mask stuff is not a joke. This is not about big, bad government telling you what to do. This is about saving lives. And that's what Donald Trump has done. He has made wearing a mask a political statement. <clears throat> and that has cost lives in my state and across this country. And he should pay a very steep price for it. Well, uh, it has turned into a political statement, uh, wearing a mask. Mike Barnacle, um, I'm sorry, I just got to ask you, what, what in the hell happened to the Red Sox pitching staff? I don't know if you remember, Mike, we won the World Series in 2018. Uh, two years later, yeah. I mean, we've collapsed. This is, this, is, this is like what happened with the Miami Marlins. Like, it's, this is, these, I, I can pitch a wiffle ball faster than these guys are throwing fastballs down the middle of the plate. What's going on? You, you can talk baseball for a second, but then more importantly, uh, yeah. What's Major League Baseball thinking about doing um, uh, as, as far as are, are they going to keep pushing ahead uh, with this season or are they going to have to shut it down? Well, to answer the last question that you asked, Joe, I think they are going to keep pushing ahead until or unless, you know, if several other teams come down with the virus and they won't, will be unable to play, then they might have to take a look at it. But right now they're committed. Rob Manfred said over the weekend in an interview they are committed to playing as much of the 60-game season as they can. With regard to the Red Sox, Joe, the Red Sox organization led by John W. Henry has always had a great affinity, a love for baseball. And so what they're doing in the wake of so many high school seasons being canceled, so many summer baseball little league seasons being canceled, American and Legion seasons being canceled. They're giving these young kids a shot at playing some baseball. Oh, that's great. Now, unfortunately, that's they're great. doing it in Yankee Stadium. Uh, but, yeah. you, you yeah. know, but the, the other thing that Claire mentioned, Joe, that, and it, it is so obvious and it's so sad that much of what we're enduring right now, much of what we're living through, the fear and the anxiety felt by millions of Americans every single day about the virus could have been mitigated more than a little if the president of the United States in January, February, March, or even now took to the TV and addressed the nation about the virus, something he has never done. He has chosen 
to abandon his leadership role as president of the United States. He could have looked into the camera and say, look, if you wear a mask, it's going to help an awful lot of people in addition to you. The choice is wear a mask or maybe die. It's a simple thing yeah. he could have done, and it would have mitigated yeah. a lot of pain that we're feeling. No, no doubt. And again, still talking about hydroxychloroquine a week or two ago. I, and again, I just don't yeah. understand it. I never will understand it. Uh, as we've been saying here since March, this is a health care problem that causes an economic problem that causes political problems for the president. If he took care of the health care problem from the start, the economic problem would be far less than it is right now. And, and, and same, same with his political problem. He just hasn't been able to discipline himself to do it for more than five seconds. Bob Costa, um, I, I'm, I'm looking at these numbers. And by the way, I'm, I'm thinking of what Mike Barnacle said about letting Little League players pitch. And it's so cool that instead of having to wait to go to Williamsport later this summer, we're pitching them right now at Fenway. By the way, uh, uh, Bob, who was on my church softball team a couple years ago, maybe they can give Bob a shot too, because uh, Bob, Bob knows how to whip that softball pretty quickly. Maybe you can throw the, the, the hardball underhanded. Trust me, if, if you've seen any Red Sox games, you know exactly what we're talking about. But, um, but Bob Costa, um, Martha McSally, uh, yes. Joni Ernst, uh, Corey Gardner, Susan Collins, Tom Tillis, Mitch McConnell, I could go on and on. There's so, Steve Daines. There's so many Republicans right now who are at risk of losing their seats and, 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 and having the Senate swing in a big way to the Democratic Party uh, after this fall's election. Uh, what are you hearing about those senators pushing Mitch McConnell to pass some sort of package that will provide relief to Americans whose lives have been shattered by this pandemic? It's a fascinating story, Joe, because when I'm talking to Republicans who are in Arizona, there's a tough Senate race in Georgia with David Perdue, in Texas with John Cornyn. They all now see this coronavirus pandemic as not a blue state problem. It's a red state problem. It's their problem. But they're still boxed in in many ways by President Trump and by their own conservative base in their states who don't necessarily want to see many Americans get a $600 extension on that unemployment federal supplement. And so at this point, some of them are still pressuring the White House not to move forward with a stimulus package, yet their own economies in their states are cratering. And this leaves a Leader McConnell and others, based on my reporting, on edge about the Senate majority, uh, because it's not just about navigating President Trump anymore, it's about navigating the pandemic and an economic crisis. And conservatism as an answer is not providing the same kind of boost in these red states that it once has. Let's go deep in the heart of Texas. And who would think we'd be t talking about Texas in August of 2020? The president is, is either tied or behind there, if you uh, believe the Dallas Morning News poll that was out a couple weeks ago. Ted Cruz is telling reporters that it's going to be a very competitive state. You've got John Cornyn running for re-election. That's not going to be a walk. And yet, here you have Ted Cruz also trying to stop any relief bills, along with Tom Cotton and others who are lining up to run for president in 2024. Uh, wh what does that do to John Cornyn in the state of Texas, especially with Houston now seeing uh, coronavirus uh, cases still exploding and up to a 20 percent positivity rate there for testing? You're so right to pay attention to Texas. I was with the president in Texas last week, and there's this image politically of Texas as being this rural state, and I was in Odessa, Texas, home of Friday Night Lights, covering President Trump. But when you look at Texas politically, it, it, I, I loved being in Odessa and Midland, but that's not necessarily Texas when it comes to the political map. Texas is, many in many ways, a suburban state, Dallas, Houston, other major metropolitan areas in Texas, and those voters have in 2018 and in recent other years, really moved the state more to the left. And you see now Senator Cruz is right when he says it's a battleground state. Uh, but Governor Abbott, he's sticking with President Trump. And this is a state that we've seen in many suburban races. It's starting to turn. And that makes President Trump really have to run up the numbers in the rural areas. But for someone like John Cornyn, who's never going to reach that, let's say, 90 percent Republican vote, perhaps, in the rural areas, if you're running behind Trump, how do you still balance out in the suburbs? It's, it's going to be a tough calculus for him and others.
Yeah, um, and 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 tell Aaron, you look at the suburban vote that that Bob just brought up. Areas that used to be reliably conservative, <clears throat> uh, whether you're talking about the, Phil, uh, the Philly suburbs or the I-4 corridor, uh, or, or the suburbs around Dallas, have actually seen white Republican voters run away uh, because of the president's uh, actions on not just the coronavirus, but before that on race. You look at Charlottesville. Uh, you, you, you look at so many other things that actually hurt the president in 2018, hurt Republicans in 2018, and they're, they're losing these suburban seats that they always had a lock on. Yeah, well, good morning, Joe, and thank you for asking me about baseball because I'm excited that sports are back too. Baseball is out, the 19th is out. Uh, you know, people want to talk about sports, and, and, and I think that a lot of these athletes are frankly trying to set an example. You see a lot of them wearing masks when you see them headed into facilities, uh, trying to protect themselves. And so maybe people who have favorite athletes who see them uh, mirroring this behavior, that, that could be uh, a positive for as long as sports are allowed to continue. But yet, listen, a lot of those suburban uh, conservative voters, particularly women, who we know are the majority of the, of the electorate, what we heard from them in 2016 uh, when President Trump was elected was, you know, let's give this president a chance. Let's see what it is that, that he's going to do. And what we have seen in the past four years over issues of race, uh, issues of gender, uh, on uh, things like family separations, things like guns. I mean, these are things that I'm hearing from a lot of, of suburban women voters, uh, you know, that, that have been uh, off putting to them and are making them uh, at least think about whether they plan to cast a vote uh, for President Trump again. Uh, if not, just stay home because uh, they maybe can't support, um, you know, Vice President Biden on the ticket. But th that is certainly something that, that uh, concerns uh, the president. He, uh, he is, you know, uh, understanding that his um, support with, with those types of voters is something that he's going to have to shore up if he plans to get reelected. You know, you, you, you talk about Major League Baseball, Aaron. One of the things that Major League Baseball has done as it's come back is reminded all of us who have sheltered in place and maybe fallen asleep a little bit on just how contagious this virus is. It has shown, if you look at the Miami Marlins, it is so extraordinarily c contagious that even young, strong, healthy athletes uh, can get it and pass it around uh, and, and reminds all of us again just how dangerous this pandemic is uh, if, if we've been sheltered in place and are just hearing about it or uh, on the news or reading about it in the papers. Uh, Claire McCaskill, you have a tweet. You say, once again, Trump goes rur after rural America. No one is more dependent on the U.S. Postal Service and rural residents, and privatization would make their mail service exponentially more expensive. First tariffs, and now he's destroying the USPS. This guy knows how to hurt his supporters. You can talk to uh, lobstermen and, and lobster women in Maine. Uh, they'll tell you about the tariffs that have hurt there. You talk to farmers, soybean farmers they'll t in Iowa. They can talk about uh, uh, the same there. But, but you look at the president trying to gut the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, you look at Republicans who aren't going to spend money on it. You're right. It's rural Americans who are going to be the hurt, hurt the most. It's just like Medicaid funding cuts. The Republicans, I, I mean, trying to explain this to them for years, they think that when they cut Medicaid, they're going to be hurting poor black people in inner cities. Okay, it's a racist thing to think. It's cold hearted, but it's also stupid. They're actually hurting rural hospitals as well. They're hurting senior citizens in nursing homes. Nursing home care is getting gutted. Rural hospitals can't face the coronavirus the way they should be able to face the coronavirus because of cuts through the years from Republicans in Medicaid. This stuff is not hard to figure out. And yet Republicans keep going after their own supporters like Donald Trump now is with a post office and like they're doing with absentee voting and mail-in voting. As, I, as we've talked about it, Claire, we Republicans figured out how to do that a long time ago. Democrats are the ones that aren't as good in that area. They get people to show up in person. But 
Don't try telling Donald Trump and the Republicans that because they keep shooting themselves politically in the foot. Yeah, if you look at Trump's numbers where the slide has occurred, first it was older voters because of his total bungling of this pandemic. And then you saw suburban women begin to fall off his support column. But the third leg that is so important to Donald Trump is rural voters. And now, first you have the tariffs. And most rural farmers I talked to and rural people, they said, well, we're going to give him a chance. We think he's trying. So that was strike one. Strike two now is the post office. You know, the post office in a rural community, Joe, is so much more important than the mail. It is um, a place where you see your neighbors. It is a place where you can, you know, go to get your medicine if you don't want to wait for them to take it down that last mile of that country road. So the post office is a big deal. And now COVID is moving into rural communities. Uh, I can speak for my state. That's where we're seeing the huge increases in COVID. And when you look at the health care problems in rural Missouri, it, it is echoed all across the country. They have ignored rural hospitals shutting down in all the states that haven't expanded Medicaid. They have ignored the fact that doctors and nurses are in scarce supply in rural America. So, and you've got Trump in court trying to do away with protection for pre-existing conditions. So huh. this is really the third strike. And if, if he starts losing rural voters, then we don't need to worry about whether or not the mail-in ballots are, ca are counted that night, because it will, in fact, be a tsunami uh, for Joe Biden, because he is really blowing mm. it with rural voters right now. I, I just, Jonathan Lemire, I do not understand why he's turning his back on rural voters. He thinks that, uh, and the Republicans think they can just wave the bloody flag of, of abortion and religion and, uh, and guns and these social issues. And that will be enough to carry them to victory. Well, you know, you can be pro-life and support rural voters economically. You can be pro-gun and defend rural voters when it comes to health care. But it's this either or choice. And you look at the post office, you look at Medicaid cuts in one instance after another. You've had Donald Trump and the Republican Party on pre-existing conditions going after rural voters. You're right, Joe, and I think you hit it around the head here that this is a, these are voters, rural voters, that Donald Trump and the Republican Party have largely taken for granted. And that makes, and while those voters probably wouldn't suddenly swing for Joe Biden necessarily, but they might not turn out at all. This is going to be an election that is about turnout. The Trump campaign's own theory of the case is that they are going to need to turn out their base, their percentage of voters, which they know is smaller than the people who like Joe Biden. The polls will all reflect that. But they believe are more enthusiastic and they'll be willing to vote in November. Well, I think Biden's support is more lukewarm. And we can we can perhaps dispute that uh, as a as a, a matter of, of whether that a strategy that could work. But that's their plan. And yet there don't seem to be at all times really playing into that strategy. They seem to be shooting themselves in the foot repeatedly and no greater than, of course, President Trump in many ways abdicating a, a, a robust federal response to the pandemic, which is indeed now uh, surging into rural areas. Uh, Jason, I want to go to you, though, on the idea of, of mail-in voting. And it seems to be sort of just a piece of a larger puzzle here. The president's attacks on the Postal Service, the president's attacks on this yes. practice to muddy the waters this November. He's been repeatedly suggesting there'll be widespread voter fraud like he did in 2016, when, of course, there wasn't any then and there's no evidence there will be any now. He's calling about delays uh, for report reporting results on election night. And I think Americans should prepare themselves. We may very well not have a winner that night. It may be days or even weeks before we know who is the next president of the United States. Uh, but talk about how dangerous this rhetoric is in terms of not just perhaps disenfranchising voter, his own rural voters, but just sowing chaos uh, that week as America holds its breath to see who's the next president. Well, yeah, first off, Jonathan, you know, I, I, I've been sounding this alarm. Other people have been sounding this alarm for months. It's no surprise that the president of the United States is attacking the post office because it's all the groups that he hates. It's government employees. It's, well, that was loud. Uh, it's government employees. 21% of the employees at the post office are African-American. About 8% are Latino. 40% are women. So this is the perfect agency for Donald Trump to sort of engage in the sexist, uh, racist rhetoric and policies that he's always engaged in. But here's the problem. 
problem. Look, I used to live in that small town. I used to I used to teach at a college called Hiram College. It's actually not even a town. It's literally a village. The post office is extremely important. They support the local baseball teams. They, they donate to charities. It's a centralized location. When you shut down the hours, you're not just attacking the delivery of mail. You're affecting one of the most stable employers in the entire region. And the president, when he engages in activity, it's not only sort of economically damaging, but I have said this for a long time. We will not know who the president of the United States is on election night. We will not know for weeks. There will very likely be battles where blue state governors are saying, keep counting those votes. And the president of the United States will say, you better stop. And he may send in federal troops. All of this is going to be a nexus on the post office. And the president is trying to set up the battle already. Casey, I know you have a question for Aaron, but really quickly following up on what Jason said, just like the post office is a, an employer, a, a really good, solid report, uh, employer in rural America, uh, the number one employer for so many small towns uh, are hospitals, doctor's offices, health healthcare services. And again, going back to uh, Republican cuts in Medicaid, uh, those are the places that are hurt predominantly, and it's rural Americans who lose jobs from those cuts as well. And the, it's rural Americans who suffer when the one hospital that's within an hour or two's driving distance of where they live suddenly closes down because their finances fall out uh, from under them. And that is one of the major inequalities in our system that's really been exposed. I mean, people who are catching COVID-19 in these rural areas already have limited options uh, to take care of themselves anyway, fewer ICU beds. Uh, and this crisis has been really, really, really hard on those rural health systems. But uh, I also do uh, want to ask, I mean, this is all obviously uh, incredibly important in the context of Joe Biden's presidential race. He's making this argument uh, that, you know, he wants to make these dramatic changes here. And we know his focus this week is figuring out who to choose uh, for his vice president. And Aaron, you have a new piece out uh, for the 19th. It's called The Outsize Importance of Biden's Vice Presidential Pick. Uh, and you write in part, quote, in 1984, she was too new. In 2008, she was too inexperienced. In 2020, will it be third times the charm or three strikes you're out for a woman vice president? Biden pledged to choose a woman as his running mate, and the decision will take on outsized significance, not only because the pandemic has dried up the typical fire hose of campaign news, but because of the hushed acknowledgement that this could be a legacy pick for the white male septuagenarian. And of course, we've seen uh, women jockeying for this position, and the Post has a piece out this morning about how there are some sexist overtones that are coming into this, particularly as people have started to talk about Kamala Harris's quote unquote ambition, which, as we know, can be code uh, for a lot of this. How do you see it playing out in the next week or two? Well, unfortunately, I see these uh, racist and gendered uh, tropes uh, continuing to resurface as, as we are seeing uh, black women kind of rise to the top of this conversation. Listen, what is politics about if not ambition? <laughs> Right. So I, I really don't understand why, uh, you know, uh, something like ambition is a bad word uh, when, when uh, you know, we're discussing uh, what is probably the most consequential election uh, many of us will ever cover. Uh, but, you know, this is definitely uh, the most uh, important decision. A lot of people are telling me uh, that Joe Biden has ever had to make in his political career. And he does have an embarrassment of riches in terms of the talent, uh, qualifications and experience of uh, these, these women uh, that he's considering. Listen, there's never been a woman vice president. Uh, there's never been a black woman nominated for vice president uh, as, as in a major party. And so, you know, with, with this ticket, uh, they have the uh, potential to not only make history, uh, but also to defeat Donald Trump, which were the two things that so many Democratic voters told me they were focused on headed into November. Aaron Haynes, thank you so much. And congratulations on the launch of the 19th. Uh, we're very Thank excited you so for much. you. Very, very excited to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, so Bob Costa, Thank talking you. about the VP selection, um, hearing what Chris Dodd uh, was saying about Kamala Harris being too competitive uh, and, and, and maybe being too ambitious. <clears throat> um, it sounds like the sort of thing that Ronald Reagan had to balance with Gerald Ford in 1980. 
uh, the sort of thing that you see time and time again. You know, Bob Dole and George H.W. Uh, Bush uh, in 88, there's a question of, of whether uh, two very competitive people can be on, on uh, the, the same ticket there. Uh, it's always been a delicate balance, and this year is no exception. And I'm just wondering, uh, with, with Kamala Harris, is there a feeling that Kamala Harris is the safest pick uh, for Joe Biden right now because she's been California's attorney general, she's been a U.S. senator, and she's been under the red-hot glare uh, of those presidential Klieg lights uh, and debated it. Uh, and, and there's just no, there's really, there's just no substitute for that. So I'm wondering, is, is Kamala Harris the safe bet because that, despite the concerns of, of, of her attacking uh, Joe Biden pretty harshly in some of those debates, suggesting actually that he's a racist? When I'm when I've been talking to top Democrats and Biden allies, Joe, it's clear that they respect Senator Harris. But Vice President Biden's experience in the Obama White House deeply informs how he's approaching this decision. And he wants not only a partner in power, but someone who he has a personal rapport with behind the scenes, similar to what he had with President Obama. Could he have that with Senator Harris? Of course. Uh, but I also hear that uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass of California is someone who is a veteran in the House. She's been a speaker of the California uh, State Assembly. Uh, she's someone who has a rapport with Vice President Biden. And she's someone who the campaign is watching as she goes out there and does these interviews with Chuck Todd and others. And they feel like she could be a solid fit. And of course, you have Senator Harris, Senator Warren, Senator Duckworth, and so many others. And the other person I think that's mostly competing with Congresswoman Bass at this point is Ambassador Rice, who also has a rapport with the vice president. Uh, and she's seen as someone who could really help him with international affairs. Going to Europe and to other U.S. allies around the world in different continents will be a priority for the Biden administration should it happen. And she is seen as someone who could really be an asset and voice for him in that effort. So at this point, uh, my short list is uh, Ambassador Rice, now, Senator Harris and Congresswoman Bass, and not necessarily in that order. Yeah, Mike Barnacle, um, again, we, we, we talk about Kamala Harris. Uh, Joe Biden wants a personal rapport with her. She's very, I mean, I know, Meek and I know Kamala pretty well, and she's very personable, uh, very likable. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, I want to go back to the campaign uh, the, for the Democratic nomination. Uh, uh, Kamala, Senator Harris went after Joe Biden aggressively, talking about segregation, suggesting that he was racially insensitive. Um, but Joe Biden's been in this game for a very long time. Uh, and I'm, yeah. I, I'm curious, is, is, is that the sort of thing that he's going to be fretting about, or is he going to be looking forward to see who would be in the best position uh, to, to uh, be his vice president? Yeah, Joe, my information from the Biden campaign and uh, from people around the, the former vice president himself is there's no residue of bitterness or anger or anything having to do with uh, the debates in the primary, Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. None. He likes her very much. Uh, Aaron Haynes said something kind of interesting and accurate in the last segment when she was here. She said politics is about ambition, and that's certainly true for every one of the candidates that Robert just mentioned and that we've been talking about. But this year, for Joe Biden and for the Democrats and for America, it's different. The way they view it is this year, politics is about winning. And so his selection for vice president is going to obviously be someone he's comfortable with. But it's going to be someone who he views as doing no harm, doing less harm than any others who might be in the field. And I would agree with yeah. Robert's rankings. Well, he didn't rank them, but the three people. And I would point out that in terms of personal, uh, getting along with someone, knowing someone, feeling comfortable with someone, Susan Rice is right at the top of that list. Kamala Harris is also there, too, not quite as close as Susan Rice is. But Kamala Harris has something going for her that Susan Rice doesn't. She's a professional. And as you pointed out, Joe, she's been out there. 
She's run for president, and there's there's no ex, there's nothing you can do to gain that experience other than to do it. Karen Bass, comfortable, familiar, great marks for collegiality in the House from her colleagues in the House, gets along with people on both sides of the aisle, gets things done, and would not run for president in 2024, which is also something that's uh, being factored into this. Well, they, uh, it, it should be about winning, as you said, uh, whether you're a Republican looking for a VP or a Democrat, uh, you know, it should be about winning and who can do the best job once they're in that position. But uh, again, I, I just, I, I just want to say, um, I, and I'm a member of Congress. I mean, uh, members of, Con uh, uh, I was a member of the House. Members of the House just aren't vetted like senators for the most part. They certainly aren't Correct. vetted like vice presidential candidates. Kamala Harris, uh, and again, I, I'm, I, I'm, uh, I'm not pitching Kamala Harris at all. I'm just saying you don't want surprises. It's hard to remember, but a lot of people were excited by the unknown factor uh, of a certain governor from the state of Alaska. And uh, you, you're right. Number one rule is do no harm. Uh, number two rule, no surprises. So uh, it'll be very yeah. interesting. Mike, I want to ask you one more quick question. Um, and, and, cause, and it's in your state. It's about two guys that you like very much, two guys that I like very much. But I got to say, it is weird. It just seems strange in this year of Donald Trump when... All Democrats and a hell of a lot of Republicans and independents are focused on what they consider a threat to the future of American democracy to see two Democrats in Massachusetts fighting like hell, spending money uh, in a Democratic primary against Ed Markey. I mean, Ed has been a Democrat's dad, I've served with him. Ed's been a Democrat's Democrat for a long time. And I like, I like Joe Kennedy, and you know I love the family. But for the life of me, I don't understand why he jumped into that race in the age of Trump. It seems like a waste of resources. Well, Joe, that question is being asked right now as we proceed to an early primary here, September first, and mail-in voting begins in about uh, just a few, very few days. That question: Why is he running? has not been answered, I don't think, by Joe Kennedy to the point where voters accept the answer. They wonder the same thing that you just raised. Why are you running? And he hasn't had a really tangible, really pointed answer to that question. Ed Markey has been in the House and the Senate now for 40 years. Uh, he is also you know, right out front in terms of the new Green Deal. He's a big environmental guy, always has been. And his secret weapon is, of course, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who has cut a TV ad for him already, a very powerful ad in which he takes on his Ed's supposedly big liability, his age. You know, he's in his 70s and he's yeah. been around a long time. And uh, she says it's not the age, it's the, the, the ideas that matter. And Joe's got a re it, it's a toss-up right now. Hard to believe, but it is a toss-up. Even with a Kennedy name, it's a toss-up. And again, they're both good guys. Joe Kennedy, regardless, is going to have a great yeah. future in, in the Democratic Party. I, I just don't understand why this year. Hey, Bob Costa, thank you so much for being here. What, what are you going to be looking at today and this week? Uh, you got to pay attention to Mark Meadows, the chief of staff, and whether he is going to end up cutting this deal or Secretary Mnuchin. It's a real test for the new chief. Uh, he has been wanting to have control. He's a former House member like yourself. But these deals have always come down in recent months to Speaker Pelosi and Secretary Mnuchin. Who's going to be the power player inside this White House? That's an open question this week, and a lot of Americans are on edge waiting to see if they're going to get another check. So, so, so given the economic uh, crisis that uh, so many Americans are facing uh, this election year, I, my instinct would be it's not a question of if, but when this week a bill passes. Is that the feeling on the Hill, or do they believe that Republicans would be dumb enough to let this drag on a couple more weeks? 
Yeah, that's such a good point, Joe, because the person to watch as well is Le Leader McConnell in the Senate. His majority is at risk. He wants to keep overhauling the judiciary in 2021. But to do that, you need a Republican Senate. And if he starts to lean into this process at all, he's the kind of person with political capital who could make a deal happen. All right. Thank you so much, Bob. Greatly appreciate it. With us now, let's bring in staff writer at The Atlantic, Ed Young. Ed's author of the cover story and the new issue out today entitled How the Virus Won, Anatomy of an American Failure. Ed, uh, we had Dr. Burks on yesterday saying we are now entering a new, more deadly phase in this pandemic, even talking about the need for people to wear face coverings inside their own home. Uh, how did we get to this point? How did the pandemic win in America? I think um, that, like, clearly, um, the federal inaction, um, the lack of clear leadership allowed um, this virus to take hold in this country, um, to spread uh, rapidly among its most vulnerable people. Um, and um, we are still not uh, we're still not fighting the pandemic as well as we could do. But I argue in this piece that um, every vulnerability that America presented to this pandemic was preventable and predictable and stems not only from the events of the last few months, but from the country's entire history. Um, it's um, devaluation of public health. Um, it's a legacy of racism and colonialism that have um, meant that so many marginalized communities have suffered disproportionately at the hands of this virus. Um, we have built a world that was more prone to a pandemic like this, but ever less ready for it. And if we are to avert future disasters that we know are on the way, or even if we are meant to, if we are to control this current one, we need to grapple with that full reality, with that full picture of vulnerability. Yeah, uh, Jason uh, Johnson is with us and has a question for you. Jason. Yeah, so Mr. Young, I want to ask this as, as, a, as a faculty member whose school has gone virtual. With your work, give us the worst case scenario. I still don't think that a lot of local school districts across the country realize how dangerous it's going to be to bring children back into school who will spread to teachers, who will spread to staff, who will come back home, that will cause spikes from major cities to small areas. What is sort of our doomsday scenario as schools reopen this fall in states that have really not gotten a handle on the pandemic at all? I mean, it's partly everything you said, and this is what I mean by, by the fact that the, the problems are predictable. We can see this coming. We, can, we know that viruses spread, and it's, it's bizarre to sort of pretend that it's not and that things are under control. If you don't control a raging pandemic that's spreading through your communities, when you reopen schools in, that community, in those communities, you are inviting disaster. And let's be clear, the problem here isn't just the COVID-19 pandemic. We are also about to enter a flu season that is going to hit children um, and everyone else on top of this existing disease at a time when, um, when uh, healthcare facilities are already seriously stretched. And that, to me, is, is my worst-case scenario. It's not just the pandemic, we have, which we have utterly failed to control, 150,000-plus deaths, but also every other, vulnerable, every other disaster that might layer on top of it. The longer we allow this to continue without sufficiently controlling <laughs> it, the more vulnerable we are to everything else that might also happen. Ed, can you speak to um, the mask mandate? and how the mask mandate has become a, a really a lightning rod of political implications in our country. Uh, con compare that to other countries around the world as it relates to wearing masks and the cultural issues around mask wearing uh, in the United States versus many other countries who have done a much better job controlling this virus. So um, much has been said about uh, America's um, individualist streak and that they might be less um, uh, likely to, uh, do, to do things like wear masks because it's seen as an infringement on your personal liberty. Now, um, that uh, might bear out in some places, but I think it is remarkable how many Americans have taken to wearing masks. This is a public health measure that went from zero to probably majority adoption now in just a few months. That is 
utterly unheard of. Now, think of how much better we could be doing if the people in charge and pe people in positions of power were to send clear, consistent messages about the benefits of mask wearing, if they were to um, actually roll out policies that encouraged and mandated mask wearing. Americans have actually gone a substantial way towards the public health measures that would save this country. And they're acting almost in opposition of leaders who are meant to protect and save them. And that truly is one of the greatest tragedies in this country in this crisis. We'll be reading the new issue of The Atlantic. Ed Yang, thank you so much. And coming up on Morning Joe.